we have Mr. Bob Swanson. Uh, so, Professor Bob Swanson makes a living teaching science concepts here at Mississippi State. Uh, you teach astronomy and natural science, correct? Physical science. Physical science. Yeah, something. Yeah. Anyways, uh, when he doesn't have an answer or sufficient explanation, he's happy to admit his ignorance. He hopes, his hope is that through the practice and application of critical thinking skills, others will come to enjoy the freedom that such honesty provides. Bob lives in Starkville with his wife, Meredith, three wonderful sons, a dog, and a cat. Everybody get up. Thank you. My plan for the evening was to contrast the differences in epistemological approach. Epistemology is the study of knowledge, or how we know what we claim to know. Cliff Knackley's book is titled, Give Me an Answer, whereas I would prefer to ask another question. Certainty, and when we are justified in being certain, would be a theme I would return to on a number of occasions during the discussion. I want to emphasize my strategy going in. Set clear ground rules. I told Cliff that I was not there to debate, nor was I there to be preached to. If they started doing that, I was going to leave. In all honesty, I wasn't really there to have a conversation either. Don't get me wrong, I would have enjoyed a conversation. In fact, that's why I'm such a fan of street epistemology, and why I included the link to the Navigating Beliefs course in the slips I handed out. Street epistemology is a way to help others critically examine the quality of their reasoning through civil conversation. I'd be happy to have an SE conversation with either Cliff or Stuart in future, but in front of an audience of 700, it simply wasn't the time or place. Because of the format, five minute statements, I didn't want to waste time rebutting straw man arguments. Rather than waste my own discussion time, I simply reminded the audience that claims, no matter how confidently asserted, are just that, claims. Making a claim does not necessarily make that claim true. To accept that something is true, that requires evidence. We'll return to that theme in question number two. So, what did my preparation look like? I skimmed through the first hundred pages or so of Cliff Connectley's book, and also watched a couple of debates on YouTube involving the Connectleys in order to get a feel for common arguments and style of apologetics. I also dropped by one of their gatherings on the drill field one afternoon before the discussion to listen in. Ultimately, I saw this as a recruiting opportunity to raise the visibility of FAMSU, as well as to perhaps get students interested in taking one of my classes. So, how to control the narrative. First, I printed up the blind spot cards, 80 of them, <laughs> clearly not enough. Not only would that ensure that students left with some resources in hand, but it would also allow me to make this event into something unexpected. The Connectleys do this for a living, traveling from campus to campus, preaching in open air gatherings, and perhaps engaging in discussions or debates like this one. I wanted to immediately put them off balance and get the audience engaged on my terms. So uh, the first question, and we'll start with you, Bob. The first question uh, is, is the universe a drag product of happenstance or intelligent design? Okay. Well, thank you, Stuart. Thank you all for coming. And uh, thank you all for coming. My goodness. I was not expecting this kind of turnout. Um, so the question being, is the universe a byproduct of happenstance or intelligent design? I don't know. You know, hear, hear that a lot from me. That's part of my introduction. Um, and there's not a whole lot I can do about it. Now, we'll refer you to, some of you got a little, little paper slip coming in. I only made 80 of them because I was not expecting this kind of turnout. So if you have to, you have one of those paper slips? Anybody got one? Awesome. Terrific. So on the, on the back, you can see, I'm actually going to borrow this again. It's a model. Uh, there's a bunch of QR codes. Uh, there is a group B for our FAMSU group. That's one of the QR codes. There's a, a blog entry called I'm Giving Up Certainty for Lent. And certainty is something I'm going to be talking about quite a bit. I worry that we are experiencing a pandemic of certainty. A lot of folks are really, really confident about things, and they really don't know why they're so confident. And it's a, return, a recurring theme in my class. Uh, there's also a QR code, here for, QR code here for a critical thinking playlist. These are videos, YouTube playlists of videos that I've created 
a little lectures about critical thinking skills. And finally, there's a QR code for the Navigating Beliefs course. I'm a big fan of street epistemology, and this is a course that you can take online, it's free, which will teach you the rudiments of street epistemology. Now on the back here, let me see, an X and a dot, right? So if you have one of these, and if you don't, hopefully one of the other people will scan the QR codes and pass it along to you. What I'd like you to do is I'd like you to hold that thing out, and with close your left eye, and with your right eye, pay a lot of attention to that dot. Really focus on that dot, and bring the paper slowly toward your nose. And one hand, does anybody notice anything? Right about a hand width from your nose, what happens? And begin to work. You shut it up. The X disappears. Thank you, the X disappears. Awesome. Now reverse. Close your right eye. And with your left eye, pay attention to that X. Don't lose that X. Bring it toward your nose. What happens? What happens when you, when you stare at the X? The dot disappears, right? Now, what they, does, does it disappear? What happens? Where the X was, it turned to just turns out to be white. Where the dot was, it turns out it kind of fills in the crosshairs, right? Is that your experience? What are, we find, what are we learning here? You're finding your blind spot. It turns out that the way the human eye is wired, there are, in your retina, there are rods and cones, photosensitive cells, that turn light into electrical signals that go to your brain. And they go there via an optic nerve, which is attached to the retina. And there's a spot where the optic nerve attaches to the retina where there are no rods and cones. Your retina, you're not getting any information from that spot. That's where you're discovering. Now, what does your brain do? Your brain guesses all the time. Where it's not getting information, it assumes, remember you closed your eye and it turned, it, it wanted to be white, right? It assumes, hey, I don't know what's going on there. I'm going to guess that whatever's there is the same as over here. That's why the crosshair is filled in. It's guessing. You can't see what's happening there, so it fills in with the context around. Okay? Pretty cool? Have we learned something? This is the limit of my knowledge of human physiology. Now, does anybody have... Has this affected your self-esteem? No. No? Okay, good. Well, if it did, you think, gosh, I got this blind spot. Go home, talk to your cat or your dog. I've got a dog named Lucy, I've got a cat named Frosty. Very exciting. And they say, I feel you. We have the same problem. Because they're vertebrates. The vertebrate eye is all on the same chain, the branch of life. Who doesn't have this problem? Your friendly neighborhood cephalopod. Talk to a squid or an octopus about this, they're going to have no clue what you're talking about. Because I chose the leftmost seat, I went first on this question. I mainly wanted to make the point that the human eye is wired poorly. And we are not alone. All other vertebrates share this lousy design. And vertebrates don't know what we're talking about when it comes to the blind spot. The audience is left to grapple with the possibility that there is no designer. Or, if there is a designer, it is inept. Or, there is a designer that plays favorites and seems to have a thing for squid and octopuses. Why am I convinced that God exists? Not because I can prove God. I cannot prove God. So why do I think the evidence is that God exists? If there is no God, then non-existence produces existence. That's a miracle. But my atheist friends have no miracle worker. Cliff started by answering the wrong question. He seemed to be looking ahead at question number two about evidence of God's existence rather than the question we were supposed to be addressing about happenstance versus intelligent design. He then went into a litany of false dichotomies and straw men. Non-existence produces existence, 
Chaos produces order, that's a miracle. Non-life produces life, that's a miracle. And so on and so on. Second piece of evidence for God's existence is order and design. If I say that this wristwatch I found coming to this meeting tonight, I'm lying on the side of the road, and if I try and persuade you that isn't it incredible the way the metal just sort of came together, the extra pieces of glass and metal just sort of fell off, and lo and behold, as a result of the impersonal plus chance plus time, we had a wristwatch, I think you might get up and walk out of here right now. That's crazy. The order and design of the wristwatch point to some type of intelligent mind, a watchmaker. Travel from the wristwatch down to the hand. The hand is far more complex, far more intricately designed than the wristwatch. If you think I'm crazy for believing this wristwatch is an accident, then what am I if I think this hand is a cosmic accident? I had just critiqued the human eye. Now Cliff shows the limitations of human hearing, or at least his own listening skills. In the wake of my blind spot demonstration, which clearly illustrated either a complete lack of design or, at best, an inept designer, Cliff presses on with his script, starting with the watchmaker argument and then talking about the intricacy of the human hand. Now, if there is no God, there cannot be any moral absolutes. Cliff wraps up by stating that without God, there are no moral absolutes. This sort of jumps ahead to question number four. In any event, the assertion that there are moral absolutes does not make it true. And even if it were true, it is unclear how Cliff could possibly necessarily link that fact with the existence of a God. I think all of us, if we are honest, know that this place is a product of incredible design. The more and more science we get, the more and more we realize just how incredibly fine-tuned this cosmos, and specifically this world, is to allow something like human life to exist. Cosmologists now say that it is unimaginable for us to even begin to grasp how small the percentage chance is that we exist here on this planet. Now, Bob said we are living in a pandemic of certainty. I could not disagree more with that. We are living in a pandemic of uncertainty. All of the studies show that, every single one. There's a reason why over 50% of you right now have clinical anxiety. That's because of the pandemic of uncertainty. When it came around to Stewart, he started with the fine-tuning argument. I would suggest you check out Douglas Adams' sentient mud puddle for an amusing rebuttal of that argument. Stewart then challenged my statement about living in a pandemic of certainty. He says he could not disagree more. He claims we are living in a pandemic of uncertainty. He goes so far as to say, all of the studies show that, every single one. Sounds pretty certain, doesn't he? Let's follow that thread, shall we? It might be worth investigating some of the many claims that Stewart makes. 50% of students with clinical anxiety, for example. Even if his numbers were accurate, how does that in any way justify a belief in a God? There's a reason why when I talk to agnostics and they say we're free thinkers, there's a reason why if you really get underneath that, they're free thinkers in the sense of they're going to continue to question, but they question so much that when they do question, they are worshiping the search because they never want to settle ultimately for a position whether there is God or there is not a God. Stewart then goes on to strongman agnosticism, essentially saying that free thinkers are worshiping the search, and don't want to settle on a position. He says you have to eventually get to the point of deciding whether there is a God or there isn't a God. You do? The default position should be non-belief up and until the moment when there is good reason to believe a proposition is true or likely true. I'm not going to believe Stewart's claims simply because Stewart believes them to be the case. So, Harvard recently, their entrance exam was set up to say, how do you differ from your parents? First question, when it comes to religion. In this country, we have a militancy towards faith and specifically Christianity. Harvard showed that in their first question of their entrance exam. So what is that so? A type of uncertainty. Now I become uncertain what I believe. And it automatically sets up with, I should disagree with my parents. I need to in order to be a free thinker. So what of the story about the Harvard entrance exam about religion? I called Harvard College's admissions office. Not only does Harvard not currently have an entrance exam, 
It has not had one in modern history. This story appears to have been made from whole cloth into some sort of God's Not Dead fever dream in Stewart's mind. I would recommend watching the 248 Thought Experiment in my critical thinking lectures as an example of confirmation bias. Now, I could perhaps be charitable and assume that rather than a non-existent entrance exam, Stewart was talking about essay prompts for prospective students. But even then, this claim is not supported by the evidence. I looked up the current essay prompts. It's not that hard to find this stuff if you are really interested in knowing true things. The third bullet point reads, Reflect on a time when you questioned or challenged a belief or idea. What prompted your thinking? What was the outcome? Again, this appears to be a confirmation bias situation. Stuart wants his persecution complex narrative to be true so bad that he is willing to twist the evidence to further confirm what he already believes to be true. Again, this panel discussion was a study in contrasting epistemologies. What do you think of the Harvard essay prompt? If it rubs you the wrong way, you'll probably not want to take my physical science survey class. I ask a similar question as part of my first homework assignment of the semester about science and pseudoscience. There is no right or wrong answer. It's mainly a prompt to get students thinking and to prepare them for some of the critical thinking lessons that are part of my science curriculum. Harvard, Mississippi State, and any other institution of higher learning that is worth attending should be seeking out students who are interested in thinking critically about their own beliefs and the beliefs of others. Think clearly about where your biases come from. Understand that we live in a pandemic of uncertainty, so how are you going to grasp and hold on to something that is truth? We all want to be truth seekers. There is a brief moment of common ground when Stuart finishes. He says, Think clearly about where, where your biases come from. We all want to be truth seekers. But in the middle, poor Stuart, he says, understand that we live in a pandemic of uncertainty. So how are you going to grasp and hold on to something that is truth? I like to use the example of a rock climber on the face of a cliff who is holding on desperately to a handhold. Sometimes you can be so convinced that your handhold is the right one that even when it gets a little shaky, you hold on to it. You add stick them. You wrap tape around it. So fixated that you are unable to look around for a better handhold. That is the problem with confirmation bias. Bob's point I agree with. We don't want to live in a pandemic of certainty when it comes to Christian faith. If you're a Christian in here, don't be certain. Don't live by the idolatry of certainty when it comes to your faith. Doubting Thomas. Doubt like doubting Thomas. Until, what does Jesus say? I'm going to physically give you the evidence. Right here, my man. Touch the nail prints in my hands. Thrust your very hand into the spear wound in my side and stop doubting. And then all of a sudden, Stewart seems to make a turnabout and backs my pandemic of certainty approach, at least when it comes to, to Christian faith. He points to doubting Thomas. He seems to advocate for doubt up until the point when there is good evidence. However, Stewart seems to have a different threshold for what he considers to be compelling evidence. A story about Thomas touching spear holes in the side of a resurrected Jesus that supposedly are the result of a story about his crucifixion? This is not good evidence. It's just a claim in a book. What evidence has either convinced you or is yet to convince you that there is a God? We all believe in a virgin birth up here. These guys believe in a virgin birth of the universe. We believe in the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. The virgin birth of the universe is this all came out of the beginning and it all popped, popped out of nowhere. That's what Cliff kept talking about and really trying to hit home. We all believe in miracles up here, but the Christian God says we have a miracle worker. So I start with that every single time. You have to. If you, I believe in the Big Bang, I believe in evolution. I think it jives perfectly with the Christian faith. If that door up there slams hard enough, we're gonna hear a big bang, and we're going to all agree that somebody closed that door very hard to cause that big bang. You have to have a great banger to create a big bang. Okay, Stuart starts with a two quoque fallacy as well as projection. 
and it doesn't get any more cogent or convincing from here on out. Now, I did think it was interesting that Stuart seems fine with the Big Bang and evolution. I'm wondering why he agrees. My suspicion is that the physical evidence has compelled his belief. But then he goes a step too far. He feels justified in deducing the existence of a god to be the banger behind the Big Bang, just as the bang of a door would be caused by a banger. Stuart is not claiming that a big dude in the back slammed the door or that a gust of wind slammed the door. Things we know to actually exist that are acting on a door that we know exists. Instead, he is making a claim akin to an invisible, undetectable fairy, something that we have no idea whether it exists or not, slamming the door. Now, I'll have more to say about falsification, also known as disconfirmation, a little later. Secondly, I believe that there is some type of God because I notice that around the world, anthropology shows us that every culture has some type of religion. We as human beings have this innate drive to know God. Now, the reason that I'm a Christian is because as I look at the different options, be it Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, the evidence supporting Jesus Christ is off the charts. To answer the question about evidence that has convinced him, Cliff started out with order and design. There's nothing new here. It's watchmaker all over again. Then he told a couple of anecdotes about not playing basketball and enjoying a delicious meal. And then he turns to anthropology. He seems to count as evidence the fact that civilizations through history have had some form of religion. Even if true, that does not necessarily mean that a god or any god is actually real. I can think of other explanations for these observed anthropological facts. And Cliff cites an innate drive to know God. Isn't it also possible that we have an innate need to have answers to comfort us and help us cope with life? He looks at some other options, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, etc., but chooses Christianity because the evidence is off the charts. Couldn't adherents of those other belief systems make the same claim? And if Cliff's evidence is off the charts convincing, why are there Buddhists, Taoists, non-believers? That evidence is not scientific. That evidence is historical. The Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are not, once upon a time, wink and blink and nod, took a boat ride. No. Instead, the Gospels are, at this time, in this place, with these people around, Jesus said this and did that. It reads like the New York Times or the L.A. Times. Remember, the cliff has promised evidence that is off the charts. So what is this evidence? Cliff admits that the evidence is not scientific. It is historical. He says that the Gospels read like the New York Times or the L.A. Times. He's essentially saying that we can trust these accounts to be factually true. Now, I'm salivating at this point. I couldn't have scripted this better. I reach for my phone and start to queue up the passages I had prepared. But the Gospels have the ring of authenticity as Christ first appears risen from the dead to a group of grief-torn women. And then over a period of 40 days, he appears to over 500 people who see him risen from the dead. That is historical evidence that he died, he was buried in a very well-known tomb, the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, and three days later, he appeared risen from the dead, and over a period of 40 days, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, which is right about 52 AD, over 500 people see him risen from the dead, and many of these people are willing to die not for belief. They're willing to die, not for a religion. They are willing to die for what they claim to have seen, the dead Christ risen from the dead. Cliff's answer was extremely predictable. From my brief skim of his book, I knew he was going to point to historical evidence pointing to the existence of his God. But listen to the certainty in his voice as Cliff ticks off this laundry list of historical evidence. The problem is that Cliff's bar for what he considers factually correct is laughably low. Bob, what evidence has either convinced you or is yet to convince you that there is a gun? Okay. Um, I want, want the audience to, to keep an ear out for claims and assertions. No matter how confidently asserted, they are just that, claims and assertions. Another thing I want to clear up is that I identify myself as a questioner. I, I believe that Cliff and Stuart believe what they believe. I know a lot of folks hold beliefs like this. I'm not nearly as convinced. 
While I didn't want to waste a lot of time addressing the many logical fallacies and spurious arguments surfaced, I did want to bring to the audience's attention that a claim, no matter how confidently asserted, is simply that, a claim. And claims, in order to be believed, must shoulder the burden of proof. Now, since Stuart was painting atheists and freethinkers with a very broad brush, I felt it was wise to distinguish myself as a questioner, particularly in front of an audience primarily composed of believers. Um, I'd actually like to read something real quick. Cliff, I'm curious enough if this rings a bell. By way of background, in Skinning Cliff's book, I had come across a story he recounted about a World War II POW camp where a prisoner gave himself up and confessed to something he did not do in order to save the rest of the group. It seemed like a story he had cribbed as a sermon starter, so I decided to investigate to see if I could substantiate the facts of the matter. It turns out that a quick Google search turned up a variety of versions of the same story, but with slight differences in the facts. During World War II, the guards at a Japanese prisoner of war camp would take the English soldiers out into the fields to do hard manual labor. At the end of one day, the guards lined up the English prisoners and counted the tools. They found that one shovel was missing. A guard called out, who stole the shovel? No one responded. The Japanese guard cocked his rifle and said, all die, all die. Suddenly, one Scottish soldier stepped forward and said, I stole the shovel. Instantly, he was shot dead. His comrades gathered up his body and the remaining tools and went back to the prisoner of war compound. Back in the prison camp, the Japanese guards counted the tools again. They found no shovel was missing. The Scottish soldier had sacrificed his life so that his buddies might live. Does that ring a bell? I've told it many times. Okay. What I'm wondering is, how confident are you that that story is factually true? Like on a scale of zero to 100%, where zero is no confidence, all doubt, 100%, all confidence, there's no way I could be mistaken. I am about 90% convinced because the man who went through that experience became chaplain at Princeton University in New Jersey, is an incredible man of great integrity, and I accept eyewitness testimony as a legitimate form of knowledge. So I think it most probably occurred about 90%. Okay, I appreciate your candor. After I read Cliff's version of the story, I was very careful in choosing my words when I asked Cliff to rate his confidence in the account as factually true. Note that I used a 0 to 100 scale, using the phrasing, no way I could be mistaken, to make the connection to the I'm giving up certainty for Lent blog. Note that Cliff claims that the source of the story is not only a man of integrity, but also eyewitness to the events described. Cliff goes on to say that he accepts eyewitness testimony as a legitimate form of knowledge. So, at that moment, the Argyll step, step forward. Argyll is Scottish. Scottish person. Stood stiffly to attention and said calmly, I did it. The guard unleashed all his whipped up hate. He kicked the helpless prisoner and beat him with his fists. Still the Argyll stood rigidly to attention, with the blood streaming down his face. His silence goaded the guard to an excessive rage. Seizing his rifle by the barrel, he lifted it high over his head, and with a final howl, brought it down on the skull of the Argyll, who sank limply to the ground and did not move. Although it was perfectly clear that he was dead, the guard continued to beat him and stopped only when exhausted. The men of the work detail picked up their comrade's body, shouldered their tools, and marched back to camp. When the tools were counted again at the guardhouse, no shovel was missing. What's your confidence that your version is factually true? I think it is factually true. Could there be errors in it? Of course there could be errors in it. But it is factually true that that event occurred. Cliff is clearly on the ropes here. If something is factually true, by definition, it cannot have errors in it. That is the very reason I phrased my initial question the way I did. Your account says he was shot. Hmm? This account says that he was beaten to death. That's a big difference. When he died is not stated in the account that I have given. I don't know where that account is actually coming from. Okay. 
But in the accounts that I give, I don't never say that he was beaten to death because we no, don't know. No, no, no. Your account says he was shot. This account says he was beaten to death. I had to point out the Cliff's account claimed that the POW was shot to death, while the Ernest Gordon text said he was beaten to death with a rifle. Cliff had just said that he would had a 90% confidence in his version being factually true, and even after I read the Gordon text, he doubled down, literally, by saying his version was factually true twice in his response. I was being an Aaron Freppin for Cliff in this moment. Too bad for him, he wouldn't find out what that means until the next question. The most fundamental reason for believing is because Christianity is true. Historically, we can be as certain about what we read of Christ's life in the Bible as of any other reported event. Your account of Ernest Gordon's, 20 years after his book was written, has an error in it. I'm and wrong. you're convinced Ten that a book that is 2,000 years old, that has been translated and, and edited, That's is five, accurate. That's five minutes. Thank you, Bob. Because I was running out of time, I moved on to another quote from Cliff's book. Historically, we can be as certain about what we read of Christ's life in the Bible as of any other recorded event. How can we possibly be confident that gospel accounts that are 2,000 years old could be considered convincing evidence when Cliff couldn't even get a historical event right that could and should have been verified before publication? It is worth noting again that Cliff claims historical evidence as a reason for him to be confident in the existence of a God. Remember that he says that the facts in the Gospel accounts are as reliable as the New York Times or the LA Times. Now, to his credit, Cliff does admit, I'm wrong. He has little choice. But as we'll see in a few minutes, that epiphany doesn't lead to lasting change in his epistemology. Okay, the uh, uh, third question we're going to answer tonight is... Can we go to Walter on that one? No, there will be opportunities on Thursday night and Friday night to ask any questions or any follow-up questions. Cliff was saved by the bell. In fact, a student in the audience got to his feet and asked for the discussion on this point to continue. I was going to make the point that we are hard-pressed to even have a high degree of confidence in Ernest Gordon's River Kwai account. Here's the text that precedes Gordon's account. Yet, noble as Angus's sacrifice was, it was not the only one. Other incidents were now spoken of that showed that death no longer had the last word at Chiang Kai. One that went the round soon after concerned another Argyll, who was in a work detail on the railway. Gordon's account is just a retelling of a story he heard in the camp. We have no real way of knowing how the Scottish POW died, or even if he died at all, or even if he existed. As far as I can tell, it's a story. It may have a noble message, but it remains a story. I would be rationally unjustified in accepting this story as factually true based on a second-hand account of hearsay. 90% convinced because the man who went through that experience became chaplain at Princeton University in New Jersey, is an incredible man of great integrity, and I accept eyewitness testimony as a legitimate form of knowledge. Sorry, Cliff. This is not eyewitness testimony. Now, to be charitable, let me go back to when Cliff claimed 90% confidence in his story. Perhaps we have different ideas about what it means to be factually true. Let's assume that Cliff meant that a POW sacrificed his own life for his comrades. No matter the nature of the murder or which account is to be believed, he remains 90% confident in that fact. For the reasons stated above about hearsay, I might put myself even lower on the confidence scale. However, I do acknowledge that POWs exist and, in desperate times, people are willing to sacrifice their own lives for others. All of these ideas have precedent. The tale, on the whole, is believable and the details, such as the manner of the death, are relatively unimportant. At the end of the day, nothing that the story claims strains credulity. However, what if the story went on to say that the fellow prisoners took the deceased back to camp, and three days later he rose from the dead and walked around? What if he invited one of the prison guards to touch his brain matter, or probe the bullet hole? These would be extraordinary, unprecedented claims. How much higher of an evidentiary bar would I require for such miraculous claims? Why does Cliff not require a similar level of evidence? Is faith a reliable method of discovering truth? We really haven't defined what faith is, 
I guess my, my question would be, depending on how, how you define it, you could, you'll all have to kind of define it for yourselves. The question is, could that method be used as a method to arrive at any point? Could I use SAFE to say that all left-handers are better, better people than right-handers? Could I take that as an article of faith? In my mind, critical thinking appears to be a more reliable way of getting at the truth. Remember that in the first question, I used a demonstration, the blind spot test, to falsify, or disconfirm if you prefer, the hypothesis that the human eye is intelligently designed. I left it to the audience to come to their own conclusion whether to modify or discard this hypothesis. I had no desire to enter into tired philosophical or theological debate with the Connectleys. This is what they do and this is what they were expecting. I wanted to engage the audience and offer them critical thinking tools. Rather than beat up on an undefined faith, I wanted to extol the virtues of skepticism and critical thinking. At this point, I did the Freppen objection demonstration and got as far as demonstrating the tool. So for example, if I were to take this glass of water and turn it upside down on Gabriel's head, we wouldn't, he wouldn't like that very much. Um, but what if I take, this is a CD case. You remember what CDs? These are the plants people used to play music on. Okay, so now we my CD case. It's tough to do without a wireless mic. My CD case on the water and I'm going to turn it upside down, I could put it over his head, couldn't I? Why is that? What's happening there? The atmosphere, 20 miles high, those air molecules, air molecules have weight. And just like at the bottom of the swimming pool, you feel pressure, right, if you're, you're hurt because of the weight of the water on top of you. The atmosphere, 20 miles high, 50 miles high, weighs down on us with an atmospheric pressure of 14.7 pounds per square inch. And that pressure keeps the card up, pushing up on that, it holds up that weight of water. Isn't that interesting? I've done this demonstration semester after semester after semester. My students in my physical science class saw that demonstration this morning. But there's more to that story. So it turns out I did that demonstration about 10 years ago when I was teaching at Inouye Community College. I did that demonstration, gave that explanation. Most students just kind of nodded and moved along. And then a hand shot up. And that moment is what I call the Freppen objection. Aaron Freppen, my student, said, what if the glass Instead of being full of water, what if it was full of air? He said, doesn't a glass full of air weighs a lot less than a glass full of water? Why is the car not staying up? I was standing there in front of 30 students Caught flat foot, and I said, Mr. Freppen, I don't know. Whether he realized it or not, I was trying to offer an olive branch to Cliff to show that I had been mistaken before. My hypothesis was that atmospheric pressure pushed hard enough on the CD jewel case to equal the weight of the water. Aaron Freppen proposed a test of this hypothesis. If atmospheric pressure was the explanation, then the CD case should easily stay in place with just a cup full of air. My hypothesis was logically contradicted by an empirical test. I had no choice but to admit to being mistaken. It was a wonderful question. It was a big moment for me as a teacher as well as, as a human being. Because I was 100% certain. Now all of a sudden my certainty has dropped. That's what an honest person does. They, they are able to adjust their certainty, especially when the claim, which is that the yeah, atmospheric pressure is holding up, is falsifiable. It's important to me that my claims, the things that I believe in, are falsifiable. If there's no element, there's no characteristic of falsifiability, then I don't really value that claim. So the question is then, 
But what's holding it up? Right, so again. How's my time, Stuart? Uh, 40 seconds. 40 seconds. I can do this. All right. Tool. Wedding veil material. explanation, you're going to have to watch my video. That QR code, that <laughs> critical thinking lectures, click that QR code and you'll get a chance to get the answer. Not only do I explain the phenomenon from a physics perspective and illustrate the process I went through in figuring it out, including the value of falsification when it comes to testing, but I also talk about the psychology of how I was so certain that I was right in the first place. <laughs> Just listen to the audience when I wrapped up my demonstration. Well done. People, uh, people used to say to me, hey Cliff, there's a big contradiction in the Bible. How did Judas Iscariot die? In the Gospels and in Acts, there's a different account. One account is he hanged himself. The other account is he fell over, split open his bowels, and his bowels fell out. There's your contradiction, Cliff. I said, really? Have you ever tried to hang yourself? Yeah, it's quite possible that the noose might slip. You might fall out over and split open your midsection. There is absolutely no contradiction in the Bible when it says, in one place, Judas Iscariot hanged himself, and in another space, he died because his bowels split open and his intestines spilled out. No contradiction at all. It's different perspectives on what really happened. Cliff is in panic mode. He knows he is losing the audience, so decides to strut out in front of the panel table and go into preacher mode. Just minutes before, he admitted to being wrong, but now he desperately tries to rationalize how he can possibly still be right. He's clearly been rattled. Remember that the question he is supposed to be answering is whether faith, faith is a reliable method for discovering truth. How telling and sad it is that Cliff was unable to own being incorrect in his account of the, POW, of the POW story. He decided to appeal to scriptural accounts of the death of Judas Iscariot instead. He waves away any contradictions as, quote, different perspectives on what really happened, unquote. Cliff misses the whole point. We have no way to be rationally justified in believing either claim. These are simply two stories about an event that we have no good reason to believe actually happened in the first place. So, bridge over the River Kwai, miracle on the River Kwai. The Japanese guards beat a man with their rifles, and they also shot him. It's not a contradiction. Shooting and beating someone with a rifle are both possible in an accurate historical account. Contortionist Cliff can't help himself as he tries to analogize the River Kwai account with the Judas story. While I may have reservations about whether the incident occurred at all, I'll accept the Ernest Gordon version of the story for the sake of argument. His hearsay account, which Cliff mistook for eyewitness testimony from a source of great integrity, says only that the man was beaten to death with a rifle. Cliff's version, in which the man is shot, appears to have its basis in Cliff's imagination. Unless he'd like to offer the source from which he got the story, it clearly wasn't from Ernest Gordon. I'd like to be an Aaron Freppin for Cliff. I want to help him critically examine the quality of his reasoning. I want to help him develop his critical thinking skills so that he may enjoy the freedom that honesty provides. So what is faith? Faith is evidence plus commitment. Faith is Evidence plus commitment for a Christian. Which means faith is not blind. Faith is based not on proof. It's based on evidence. Tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, I will get on a hunk of metal at your airport here. 
And I will trust that hunk of metal with my entire body to fly me safely to Atlanta Airport. <coughs> Before I step on that hunk of metal, I'm going to see the word Delta, Boeing. And I'm going to say, ah, there is evidence, not proof, but evidence. Evidence that that hunk of metal was put together by reliable mechanics. Based on that evidence, I'm going to make an incredible commitment. I'm going to step onto a hunk of metal, trusting it to get me safely to Atlanta, Georgia. So now we finally get to the question at hand. Is faith a reliable method for determining truth? Cliff defines faith as evidence plus commitment. He uses his upcoming flight as an example of this definition of faith. So, what to make of this definition of faith? Evidence plus commitment. From my point of view, if the evidence is compelling enough, there should be no need for commitment. If this is his definition of faith, which would he prefer to have more of? More evidence or more commitment? If he were about to board the plane and crossing the skyway saw that the open door was just barely hanging on, how committed would he need to be to board that plane? What if there were numerous news reports of Boeing safety records having been falsified? Would any number of past inspections or certifications allow him to commit to boarding? Would he prefer to have more evidence or more commitment? Christianity is falsifiable. It's recorded in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The Apostle Paul writes, If Jesus Christ is not risen from the dead, you're fools. I'm a fool for believing in him. But if Jesus Christ has risen from the dead, it is very wise to believe in him. That appeals to me as a thinking human being. It means that Christianity is verifiable or falsifiable. Cliff claims that Christianity is falsifiable. Where have I heard this before? <laughs> In preparation for this, for this discussion, I did watch a couple of online debates, including this one against Matt Dillahunty from June 20th, 2023. This one coming in from Skeptics and Scoundrels. Thanks for becoming a channel member. And they also said, Cliff, do you have falsification criteria for the biblical claims about Jesus? In other words, if one or more scriptures regarding him is false, how would you know it? Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, if Christ is not risen from the dead, we're fools for believing in him. In other words, the Bible gives us a way to verify or falsify Jesus Christ. Does the evidence point to him rising from the dead or does it not? And if he did rise from the dead, he's the truth. If he didn't rise from the dead, he's false. This, this one is coming a out. clear demonstration that Cliff does not understand what falsification is because a book telling you, hey, if it's not true, then we're foolish, might mean you're foolish. I had just shown falsification in action only five minutes before. I'd recommend watching my whole Frep and Objection lecture to see several more examples of falsifiable explanations. What would be an explanation that is not falsifiable? Imagine that I claim that the CD jewel case was being held up by invisible, undetectable fairies. And not only are they invisible and undetectable, but they are also capricious, holding the card up when they know there is water in it, but refusing to hold it up when the cup is only filled with air. If I believe that such fairies were the explanation for the phenomenon, there is nothing I could learn or find out to make me more or less confident in this explanation. So now the question is, what is the historical evidence that Christ really did rise from the dead? It begins with, he really did die. He didn't swoon or lapse into unconsciousness. He really did die. And we get the evidence for that in the Gospel of John, where we read that the Roman soldier took a spear and jammed it into the side of Christ, and an issue of watery serum, separate from red hard clotted blood, flows from his side. That is not known in the first century to be a medical sign of death. We know today that if you have a major gash in your torso and watery serum flows out from hardened blood, you've not been sucking wind in the past couple of minutes. Cliff clearly does not know what falsification means, so he decides to shoot for verification. What evidence convinces him that the resurrection of Christ really happened? Either Cliff doesn't remember what happened during question number two, or he can't help himself from following his script by rote. He launches into what he is convinced is historical evidence. Christ really did die, said with such certainty. How does he know this? He doesn't even know whether a Scottish POW was shot or beaten to death, something that was clearly in his power to figure out. 
We read in the eyewitness account, they take the body of Christ off the cross, they put it in a tomb, they roll a stone in front of the tomb, they set a guard to make sure there's no hanky-panky, no stealing of the body, and then we read that three days later, this dead Christ appears risen from the dead, first of all to some grief-torn women, and then over a period of 40 days, he appears to over 500 people who saw him risen from the dead. Why did Christianity grow so fast in Israel? Why were Jewish people willing to die for this supposed resurrected Messiah, this seconds. resurrected Christ? Cliff then says that, quote, we read in the eyewitness account. Again, Cliff, it is not an eyewitness account. Who is the eyewitness? It is nothing but hearsay. And while I clearly question Cliff's standards for what he considers convincing evidence, none of this is remarkable. Criminals were crucified in first century Palestine and something had to be done with the corpses. Then he cites the same historical evidence of the risen Christ that we already heard when he answered question number two. Sorry, Cliff, it wasn't convincing the first time. He cites the rapid spread of Christianity and the martyrdom of early Christians as more historical evidence. How does he know who died, how they died, or why they died? Because the historical facts are too many people saw Christ risen from the dead and they converted and put their faith in Christ. Faith is evidence plus commitment. Could commitment to believing an idea actually be an obstacle to viewing evidence objectively? Stewart appears to be so committed to the idea that there is a, quote, militancy toward faith and specifically Christianity, unquote, that he sees the discussion prompt reflect on a time when you question or challenge a belief or idea and translates that in his own mind as I should disagree with my parents in order to become a free thinker. Is it possible that the commitment to a claim could result in a confirmation bias that can actually blind you to what is actually real and true? So the physical constants that Bob had to work with here in order to pull off his experiments, he had to believe that those physical constants would remain constant in order to do that. As far as I can tell, the atmosphere is going to apply a pressure of 14.7 pounds per square inch and Spoiler alert, water, being a polar molecule, is going to exhibit surface tension whether I believe it will or not. The physical constants that modern science has elucidated are descriptive, not prescriptive. What Stewart is trying to do here is two things. Put the physical constants of the universe on the same footing as the moral absolutes he is about to appeal to, as well as to make the two quoque fallacy, trying to make religious belief appear to be more rational by claiming that scientists have to believe in things like physical constants. Is belief a good thing or a bad thing, Stuart? That being said, I did have a reasonable expectation that the CD jewel case would remain in place when there was water in the glass. It has always worked in the past. For years, I thought I was right and was giving the correct explanation to my students. You could even say I believed I was right. But believing something, no matter how fervently, does not make it so. The disciples, radically different. They saw the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who made claims and backed them up by his life, and then they were willing to die for what they saw based off of that evidence that he rose from the grave. No one is going to die for what they know to be a lie. At that moment, the Arbel stepped step forward. Arbel is Scottish, Scottish person. I stood stiffly to attention and said calmly, I did it. The guard unleashed all his whipped up hate. He kicked the helpless prisoner and beat him with his fists. Still, the Argyle stood rigidly to attention, with the blood streaming down his face. His silence goaded the guard to an excessive rage. Seizing his rifle by the barrel, he lifted it high over his head, and with a final howl, brought it down on the skull of the Argyle, who sank limply to the ground and did not move. Although it was perfectly clear that he was dead, the guard continued to beat him and stopped only when exhausted. The men of the work detail picked up their comrade's body, shouldered their tools, and marched back to camp. When the tools were counted again at the guardhouse, no shovel was missing. The problem is that believing something that is actually not true feels the same as believing something that is true. And it is so easy for us to be certain that we are right. Certainty, there's that word again, Stuart, is psychologically seductive. 
Assuming that any of the stories of martyrdom of early Christian disciples are true, and all we have are hearsay accounts, just because someone dies for what they believe to be true does not make the thing they believe to be true actually true. And he brought up the Japanese uh, war camp, so I want to go here for a second. The Shintong compound, I'd like you to read it, by Lan Dang Gyoki. And Lan Dang Gyoki talks about how he went to China. But he was from Harvard, he ditched his faith, he thought faith was a joke. He was a secular humanist from Harvard. Lan Dang Gyoki went back to his faith because of the sacrifice and the love he saw in Eric Little. And he understood every human being has a simple problem. The secular humanist says every human being is perfect, is great. Is innately great. No. The Christian understanding is we are created in the image of God, we are great, but we have a Thank sin you, nature. Thank you. Stewart tells a story about another POW camp and a guy, Langdon Gilkey, who would tell of his conversion and then make a living teaching and writing about Christianity. He essentially is making the argument that without faith, humans would be horrible to each other, desperate to survive, just like those POWs he describes. We'll talk about this in question number four. All right, so in Back in Vietnam, there was a sociologist at UPenn, and he listened to many students come up to his open mic and blast away, and they're thinking of the Vietnam War. And so many said, you're gonna go blow up villages, you're gonna kill babies? This is horrendous. And on and on they went. Finally, a student stood up and said, you guys are all wrong here. Why do you care so much about babies being bombed? That's ridiculous. And this person, she went on to say that I have an eternal value system that transcends moral relativism, where it's just I decide whether growing up babies is wrong, growing up tribes is wrong, or not. After she said that, atheists tried to respond, say, well, it's for the good of humanity that we should stop this. And she responded by saying, well, who defines the good of humanity? And why the preservation of life if there is no more Moral objectivity and eternal values. You could have heard a pin drop. The conversation completely stopped. All moral relativists, all atheists, just listened to her. Martin Luther King Jr. talked about the same thing. A law above the law in order to critique and say the racism in Alabama and beyond is really objectively wrong. Stewart starts question number four, and surprise, surprise, it's another story from Southeast Asia. Essentially, it boils down to this. Without some overarching moral objectivity and eternal values, humans would, wouldn't be able to determine what is good for humanity. He then drags MLK Jr. into his line of argumentation, saying that there was a, quote, law above the law in Alabama, unquote, that says that racism is wrong. How do you know this, Stuart? This is yet another assertion, and I think there is plenty in Scripture that would call the truth of this assertion into question. I don't know how to help you here. If all that keeps you from bombing villages, being a racist, or burning cats is a belief in some moral lawgiver, then I would encourage you to continue to hold that belief. Let our morals as a construction of individual uh, or societal decisions and norms. In order to have a moral, you've got to have a thinking mind. This table, this stage, the ceiling has no ability to make a moral decision. In order to understand right and wrong, in order to define right and wrong, you have to have a thinking mind. So what are the options? First option, I only know four options. First option is the powerful, elite. They define right and wrong. My problem with that is the Nazis had lots of power. I am convinced that gassing Jews was wrong. Second option, the majority to find right and wrong. My problem with that is, if you are living in a culture like a gang that defines good as you have to go out and murder someone in order to be part of our gang, that does not make it right. Just because the majority of people in a culture or a group agree on what's right or wrong. Third option is, well, the power elite the majority, ah, oh, it's the individual. It really comes down to the individual. Morality is relative, and so it's you who define right and wrong for yourself, and I define it for myself, and it's all relative. Therefore, you better not tell me what's right and wrong, and I better not tell you what's right and wrong, because it's all relative. 
The problem with that is, I am convinced that there's more than enough evidence that I have made a lot of mistakes, that you have made a lot of mistakes. And if you're going to try and ground morality in individualism, and it's the individual who creates it, you're in trouble. Because that means there is absolutely no right and wrong objectively. It is simply a prejudice, a bias, a subjective experience. And then the fourth option is God. An eternal being whose character is good and right and wrong are defined by God's character, which means there never was a time when right and wrong did not exist. Because God is eternal, God's character defines right versus wrong. God has given us rational minds and consciences, which we, by exercising, can begin to understand what is right and what is wrong. Now, if there is no life after death, it is impossible for right and wrong in any objective sense to exist. Why? Where is Adolf Hitler if there is no God right now? Where is Mother Teresa if there is no God right now? In the same place. It's called the fertilizer pit. Just like Stuart, Cliff makes a similar appeal to some transcendent morality that supersedes his scripted list of three other possibilities for the source of morality. The powerful elite, the majority, and the individual. Cliff ultimately gives away the game near the end of his remarks. He needs some sort of divine justice. Without some sort of ultimate reckoning, Adolf Hitler and Mother Teresa are on the same footing, or underfooting, in the fertilizer pit, as Cliff calls it. While I can empathize for this desire to see Hitler punished for his crimes in the end, wanting something to be true and it actually being true are entirely different things. In my notes, I had written down a couple of stories of my own that did not occur in Southeast Asia as possible illustrations for the source of ethical or moral behavior. I'll share one here briefly so I can also share some video. This was shot several years ago when my family was on vacation at Disney World. Waiting for at least an hour for the Seven Dwarfs Mine Train, I decided to turn my camera on my fellow humans in the cattle chutes. I couldn't help but thinking, thinking, here we are, people of all ages, sizes, colors, nationalities, educational and socioeconomic backgrounds, speaking a variety of languages, holding all kinds of religious beliefs or none whatsoever. Jumping the line and rushing to the ride would quickly descend into chaos, if not violence. Yet we've all figured out that the most efficient way for as many of us standing out in Florida's July heat to get to ride is to line up and wait our turn. I like the chances for secular morality to inform other ethical behavior when we recognize that we must all share space and resources. It's a small world after all. Okay, Bob, to close out the night, the final question is, are morals just a construction of individual or societal decisions and norms? All right, heavy question. Oh, you can't have it yet. I promise there's something good coming. First of all, I am so, so thrilled that everyone turned out tonight. I hope, you know, these are, these are important questions, and you guys are at the perfect time. It gives me great, great hope for the future that so many people are interested in asking these questions. Keep on asking the important questions. Important questions like, can vegetarians eat animal crackers? <laughs> if vegetarians eat vegetables, what do humanitarians eat? Get it, Tom. Huh? <laughs> and why don't dogwood trees ever get fleas? He's saying it's great. Love it. <laughs> you guys have been so patient listening to all this. Let's play a song, Kelly. Good. My guitar won't get picked up, but I wrote a song. This is actually about childhood curiosity. Instead of opting for the story, I went for a song. Something unexpected that would wrap the evening up on a high note. Pun intended. I used to say that childlike curiosity was something that people seemed to lose when adulthood rolled around. I've revised my position. I think people remain curious. It is just that the siren song of certainty rings louder in adult ears. 
I couldn't have asked for a more successful discussion panel. I stuck to my game plan and accomplished what I, start, what I stated in my introduction, demonstrating that through the practice of critical thinking skills, we can all enjoy the freedom that intellectual honesty provides. But why don't dogs and trees ever get clean? Why don't dogs and trees ever get please? Be not or if the flowers or could it be that the bark is bigger than a little bee? Why are the scratching when it's sleeping in the middle of the night? Do they make a big collar just fit for a tree? Say, friend, that makes the phrases for the little bees. Do you ever ask questions about a silly ass? Do you want a dog with tree? As you get to you. Well, did you ever stop to wonder why a question mark's bent? I asked your mom and then I asked her why I'm pussy here today. The letter Y is my favorite in the alphabet. My favorite game is two questions that I've never lost yet. Does Dandelion roar? Can you tame a tiger lily? Do horse flies wear saddles or is that just something silly? The one question is bugging me I've never understood. But these two upon the dog have made two upon the wood. Why don't dogs with trees ever get pleased? Sleep powder in the flowers or could it be that the bark is bigger than a little piece by other oh, stretch when it's sleeping in the middle of the night? Do they make a clean collar just to pour a tree? Same brand that makes a crazy stuff with little bees, bees. Do you ever ask questions about the silly as these by the dog with trees? Every good things. Ah, this born a boy, wonder kind of always wonder why. The color blue seems to be the perfect color of this. The color blue seems to be the perfect color of this. Did you ever wonder why it tastes like a willow leaf? You should count on the red when you get the dog to sleep. Are there apples made of crap? Are there flies made out of butter? The chocolate milk only comes from special cows and chocolate udders. And what pestering questions is going to be? Okay, let's leave the cricket people making all the children. It's getting too scary. Why is the dog with trees and gets these? I'm not even face my friend. How old is he? Ah, he's like four. Same friend with the same friend. Yeah, yeah. He's a nice guy. Yeah, I've had a couple of kids. Do chickens get the chicken pox? What does a pirate wear a patch? Do these questions come to mind? It's like an inch. I got a scratch. Why is the word phonetically not spelled phonetically? Tell me, is there any cure? For my curiosity, why don't dogs with trees ever get pleased? Three times a little time, four kids. Let the world be bigger than the little trees. Five other times, a little bigger than the little trees. Five other times, a little bigger than the little trees. Five other times, a little bigger than the little trees. Five other times, a little bigger than the little trees. Five other times, a little bigger than the little trees. Five other times, a little bigger than the little trees. Five other times, a little bigger than the little trees. So, I have 45 seconds. We don't have that kind of applause. I will mention my, my sound hall here says, for those in the back, this machine surrounds certainty and forces it to think again. This is an homage to my folk music heroes, Woody Guthrie and Pete Seeger. Woody Guthrie had on his guitar, this machine kills fascists. Pete Seeger said, this machine surrounds hate and forces it to surrender. I implore you, anytime you think you're certain about something, ask another question. Check out my QR code again. I'm giving up certainty for life. Read that blog post. Check out my content. Thank you so much for coming out there. In the weeks following the panel discussion, I've received feedback, both positive and negative, and mostly from students. Some simply didn't get the point of some of my demonstrations in the moment. So let me quickly summarize the points I was trying to communicate in each discussion prompt. The main goal here was first to make clear that I am happy to say, I don't know. In my mind, becoming comfortable with saying, I don't know, is probably the key to having to say it less. It is also important to mention that saying, I don't know, doesn't mean I don't want to know. And it is even more important to mention that thinking that you do know or that you have the truth can often cause you to stop seeking. Since the prompt referenced intelligent design, the purpose of passing out the blind spot cards was to provide the audience a visible or 
not visible, if you like, example of how the human body is just not that great. Anyone, including the Connectleys, who advocates for an intelligent designer must now grapple with admitting the ineptitude of the design. While I did not know until arriving that evening the format of the discussion or the order in which we would be answering the prompts, the choice of the stage leftmost seat was a fortuitous one. I would immediately follow Cliff's response, and he could not have teed the ball up better for me. This, in my mind, was the most important of the prompts. That which does not exist cannot be the cause of other things, such as the universe that is the subject of question one, or the ethics morality of question four. So question two became the focus for my preparation. Cliff and Stuart are the ones making the claim. They are the ones who shoulder the burden of providing evidence. This question asks exactly that. What is the nature of the evidence that they have found convincing? As I knew he would, Cliff cited the factual reliability of scripture as historical evidence that supports his belief. And, as you now know, things did not go well for Cliff. This was probably the second most important question of the night. The prompt asked about how to discover truth. In my mind, critical thinking is the most reliable method. Some students may have watched my Frevin Objection demonstration and seen only a magic trick, but it is so much more. It is a study in robust epistemology that stands in stark contrast with the Connectley's faith. Critical thinking includes that extremely important characteristic of falsifiability. Holding a belief that is not falsifiable puts you at risk of believing something that might not be true. Cliff claims that faith is evidence plus commitment, but demonstrated in question number two that he lacks the critical thinking skills to assess the reliability of what he counts to be evidence, whether historical or anthropological. Without evidence, his faith equation winds up being solely commitment. I'll leave it to the viewer to think about the consequences of being firmly committed to an idea, in other words, being certain, in the absence of evidence. Cliff claims that Christian faith is falsifiable, while clearly demonstrating that he has no idea what falsifiability means or entails. Just like Cliff parroted the same talking points during the discussion panel as he did in the online debate eight months prior, my belief is that Cliff will likely be saying the same things about the falsifiability of the Christian faith six months from now, on another campus, or during another online debate. That is my belief. Of course, my belief is falsifiable. The ball is in Cliff's court to falsify it. I'll be happy to be wrong. As I mentioned before, any connection this question has to belief in a God requires that the God exist in the first place. And based on the responses I heard from Cliff and Stewart to question number two, I remain far less convinced than they are. As far as I can tell, absent any external force, we are left to figure things out on our own. The discussion panel had already dragged on for almost 90 minutes, and many students had arrived an hour before the panel started. There was nothing I could say in five minutes that was going to make a conclusive case for secular morality to an audience of mostly believing students. The best I could do was to congratulate them for being interested in these topics and encourage them to utilize the critical thinking skills I model, and of course the resources printed off on the QR codes from those blind spot cards, as they continue their questioning. 